Hey there, YouTube. My name is Brad. I'm the Harley Davidson Wizard. This is the second part of replacing a transmission in your Harley Davidson. We're going to start with getting the transmission oil and the engine oil out of the oil pan. So you should start pulling your drain plugs and let them drain. It's wise if you do this ahead of time. But sometimes I'm not that wise and I just get into a project and we got to get it done. So a lot of different reasons go into why you quote a particular vehicle repair the way that you do. The reason that we quoted this re repair and that we're going about it the way that we are is first the customer has an extended service program so the customer doesn't feel the cost to him directly. Second, it's a new customer to the Harley Davidson world so that's even more reason uh, to make sure that this is a good experience for the customer because if he's happy with this Harley Davidson he's happy with our uh, service then he'll be happy coming back to the dealership and buying another motorcycle. And that's how the world spins. And I like making things absolutely as perfect as they can be. So with those three things in mind, the way that we quoted this project, the way that we communicated with the customer's extended service program, we're going to be replacing the transmission case along with the transmission gear set assembly. So in the previous episode, we had talked about how the customer was told when he bought this vehicle that it had a new transmission in it. And ultimately it was a botched used gear set assembly. So after we're all done here, the customer will actually get what he had originally thought he had purchased. A low mileage 2016 Street Glide with a, I want to say it's a Screaming Eagle Stage 4 kit and a new transmission. We're going to fix up some of the other aspects of the motorcycle and it's going to end up being a pretty nice, pretty nice vehicle for someone. Alright, so let's get to getting, getting this project going. So you're going to use a 3 16 Allen socket to get all the oil pan bolts off. It helps if you have a ball allen for some of the screws on the right hand side but depending on how your setup is you don't need it. The way I'm going about replacing this transmission assembly is different than it's listed in the service manual. It's a modified setup I do and I, I normally do this because I've been doing a couple transmission assemblies and transmission cases on trikes. Because people with new trikes, uh, it must be because of the added power of the Milwaukee 8. But I've had this one guy where he, he does wheelies on the trike and blows third gear off of it all the time. And <laughs> I've replaced the transmission three times and the transmission case at least once, maybe twice. So I do this modified way of pulling the transmission case because on a trike it's a real pain in the butt because there's a body, a rear differential and all of that. Uh, normally you would take off the rear wheel and the swing arm and all that jazz and probably just slide the transmission out the back. Uh, the way that we're going to do it on this is we're going to try to move the wheel and the swing arm back while it's attached to the vehicle and then pull the transmission out of the center of the vehicle and see how it goes. So we're getting started with obviously you'll want to pull the negative ground cable that's on the transmission case along with unplugging or unscrewing the vehicle speed sensor that we did just a little bit earlier. Now we're pulling the foot peg and somebody put some ghetto screw in the bottom of the foot peg assembly. 
we'll replace that on our way back through. You can tell the quality and the craftsmanship of the previous repairs from something as simple as that foot peg screw. The bottom foot peg screw on this particular model doesn't hold the actual foot peg onto the motorcycle, but it uses it to adjust it in the three adjustable positions. There's zero chance that original adjustable screw ever fell out of the motorcycle. It's loctited into the bike and then it has a ground down surface so it doesn't even pinch the foot peg to the frame of the vehicle. The original person that replaced this transmission took that foot peg off and lost the friggin bolt. Things like that are just, they, they wear on me so much. It's such a simple task to pull things apart, put things together, and realistically, the quality of being a technician, the simplest task that you have, and also one of the very most important tasks, is putting bolts in correctly. It's so crazy. It just blows my mind. It really... It really rubs me the wrong way. I'm sure I'm going to say that a thousand times through through the total repairs of this video, but some people should not be doing this. So we're going to need to pull the pivot shaft bolts off the pivot shaft. Actually, it's a nut. The pivot shaft nut. On this frame setup, the cleave block, which is the rear engine mount and the swing arm mount, is permanently attached to the frame on the right hand side so that means that we need to get the nut off on the right hand side so you pop the little black cover off and then make sure you use a six point socket because it's a very soft nut and then get the fastest gun that you have and try to run the nut off if you don't you can use an old push rod tube with a butane not a butane, but a propane torch and heat the Loctite up a little bit. We got lucky in this situation because usually it doesn't go as easily as it does or as it did here. But the nut came off and then you take off the couple bolts for the cleave block, pull the pivot shaft assembly out. But before you pull the pivot shaft assembly out, you want to make sure that you have the transmission supported correctly because the pivot shaft is the rear engine mount and if you just yank it out the transmission and the swing arm will both fall down and falling is not something that's very good for aluminum aluminum components like the transmission case and the oil pan so you want to be careful with what you're doing make sure everything's supported make sure your vehicle is adequately supported you can see how i have it on the hoist where the front wheel is obviously in a wheel truck but then I also have a strap around the wheel to keep it in the chuck. And then use something soft to support your transmission and your oil pan assembly. That green thing that I, I had just shown is a stack of old business cards wrapped in green tape. And that makes it so it's nice and soft, but also very firm. So it's a good lifting device. So we're getting ready to pull the left cleave block with the rear engine mount and the pivot shaft out. You can see how I was just lightly wiggling things first. You can get all, you know how it is, you can feel the tension on something through the wiggle. So you wiggle it lightly, make sure that you have the transmission assembly supported right where it wants to be. Then finally pull out the screws for the cleave block and pull the pivot shaft out. We just slid that out and laid it on the hoist there. And then lightly, or at least slowly, release the pressure on the transmission. And it will lay right on the cross member without maxing out the engine mounts or the... Um, front stabilizer links or anything so there's no damage or anything done to the engine 
And this is where we come into the modified transmission case removal. I'm using a, a ratchet strap. And I just have it tied right around, I want to say, the rear axle. So that it's a soft it's a soft strap so it won't leave any type of marks or anything but you don't want to wrap it around a shock that just that wouldn't make any sense so I have it wrapped around the rear saddlebag support and you can see as I'm ratcheting it it's pulling the rear the rear wheel rearward and it's taking the swing arm with it and I believe in this situation we'll have to lift the swing arm just slightly so it fully clears the transmission case and this transmission case is almost out of here. But you want to go slow. There's no reason to no reason to rush things and start busting up or chipping or marking engine components. The difference between saving five or ten minutes in the end of the day and having something that's a hundred percent perfect or something that looks questionable because it has a bunch of chips and damage all over it isn't worth 10 minutes. So here I find that I need to lift the engine up a little bit and the little support block that I had made for the transmission is too thick. So I had just cut some, those are like fake license plates that we have at the dealership. It has the dealership name on it. So I just cut those in half, put them under the front uh, scissor jack that way it lifts the engine up a little bit and also the flat jack supports the bottom of the frame so that we're able to use that second flat jack to move it backward and lift the swing arm up just a little bit. Honestly in retrospect it's probably easiest to just remove the rear wheel and the swing arm. Uh, in this particular situation, like I was saying, I normally don't do it for the previously mentioned reasons. Also, when you take the rear wheel off, you have to reset the, the belt tension, which isn't that big of a deal, but it does save you a couple minutes. I should have known better because of the way the rest of the, this bike was. Once I got it all back together, even though I hadn't touched the rear axle, the belt was super loose because, of course, the guy that had worked on this thing before me had zero clue what he was doing. So I still had to tighten the belt anyways, which really meant that it was like the same amount of work. But it can also be tough on your back because the swing arm is heavy and the rear wheel is heavy. Well, the swing arm is steel and the rear wheel is a big tire and aluminum rim and all that business. And my back has been a little wacky, so I'm trying not to lean over while holding big heavy things so that coupled with potentially saving a minute or two with not doing belt adjustment made this the direction that we're going but fiddling back and forth with the flat jacks and cutting the license plates i don't know it's probably about the same amount of time either way that you go so now we're just finishing up Removing the last four screws that hold the transmission case assembly to the back of the engine. You want to make sure that the transmission case has zero tension or that it's not caught in a bind or anything. Leaving the engine in a, in a weird funky position. That's where the engine supported by the license plates that we cut in half. The frame is supported by also that front scissor jack. Earlier, earlier, you had seen me wiggle the oil pan so that we know that the transmission isn't exert, it isn't like sitting on the oil pan that would be sitting on the cross member. So the oil pan's nice and loose. The transmission will be loose. Make sure that you remember that there's two different size screws for the transmission to engine. Um, mount I guess the bolts are different length is what I'm saying the bottom two bolts go through a dowel pin so the bottom two bolts are longer here we see that even though that the transmission case doesn't have any tension on it from the engine 
it does still from the swing arm a little bit because the rear fender only goes back so far. I already have the rear tire pulled back into the fender. Uh, not tight or anything. Just as far back as the rear wheel will freely want to go like this. So that's where we use this extra scissor jack that I have. If you're using scissor jacks, especially uh, like the way that I have the one in the front set up so that there's a lot of leverage on it. Because you aren't the one that's under the engine, if you start cranking on that one, you aren't just lifting the entire weight of the vehicle on it. You're also getting a lot of extra force on it because the front end is held in position by the, by the wheel chuck. So make sure you have some good quality center, center uh, scissor jacks, sorry. You don't want to be using some cheapo eBay ones and be putting that kind of pressure on them and have that be the only scissor jack that's under the vehicle. Because if something goes wrong, then there is no backup and you're going to be you're going to be in some trouble. So, have high quality stuff or have multiple cheap things is what I'm saying. So here we're just we're lifting up the the swing arm just a hair. We lifted it up just enough so that we can slide the oil pan out the back of it. That's going to give us enough room to move the transmission case rearward off the dowel pins. Actually, the dowel pins are in the transmission, so we're moving it rearward just to disconnect it from the engine. And then we should be able to swing it out the left-hand side. So here we go. She's ready. She wants to come out. She's telling us. But we're being smart about it. We're wiggling it. We're taking a second. We're looking around. You don't need to get in here and start prying up against stuff with big pry bars. Everything's aluminum. We already talked to the transmission. She's telling us. She wants to come out. She wants to be brand new. You just got to listen to her. Just taking our time, wiggling it. Easy peasy. We got the case out. So now is basically midway through the project. Everything is apart and we're going to be putting everything back together now is a good time to clean up your area I always like to once I have an engine or a transmission out like this I clean up the frame rail and everything you aren't going to be able to get back in there with a pressure washer or a brake cleaner or whatever so now that we have it out you know just road debris and grime from changing transmission fluid a little bit of that oil gets down there on that cross member it's caked full of oil. Oil gets sand and stones in it. So then you have a bunch of grit and crap. And we don't want to contaminate the, the new ceiling surfaces of the engine or the transmission or any of that with this crap that's on the frame. So we're going to take a couple minutes and clean up that, that crossover. Again, I like using, it's called a uh, brake, well, I believe it's called parts cleaner, but it's a particular product from Worth, and it doesn't have any type of adverse reactions to frame paint or engine finishes or paint or clear coat or anything. It's not like brake cleaner that you get from AutoZone in an aeros aerosol can that the aerosol can is a much harsher product than what I'm using. What I'm using, you can typically get it at a parts store, but you buy it in like a five gallon container. And it's really the only way to be doing this. But I get in there, 
I have a brush that I have for a, a parts washer tank that I pop out. It's just a stiff brish, bristle brush. Get in there, clean everything out. Make sure that you have the ports on the back of the engine covered up because the way that the engine oil is transferred from the oil pan that's under the transmission is through a passageway built into the transmission case and then through a gasket and then into the back of the engine case. So if you just pull the transmission case out of there and start blowing things around, there's open holes of how oil gets into the engine. So just be aware and, you know, be double checking what you're doing so you don't mess things up. It's really overkill, but clean it, clean in this area. It's going to make it nicer for us to get in there and to work. Realistically, it's not like the customer is going to get down there and go, oh my gosh, it looks so nice and clean. You know, I'm glad that you fixed my crappy motorcycle all up so it's amazing and you cleaned it but it matters to us because we're going to be in there we're going to be working in there you can see how i'm wearing gloves in situations like this i use a lot of gloves in the tear down and cleaning component of the repair and then i take the gloves off while doing the assembly and that's so that i can feel any type of dirt or grit there's Obviously, you know, like if you're getting getting pebbles stuck in in gasket surfaces, then you aren't even looking, but small grit and contaminants you can feel with your fingers much better than you can can see them. Uh you know, things that are at a magnifying level. So That's the way I like to do it. Get in there, clean it up. That way She's all nice and tidy when you're putting her back together. So now that we've essentially reached the midpoint of the repair of this motorcycle, we're going to speed it up because it's basically the opposite of the teardown, along with paying attention and torquing things to spec. It's basically the exact same, but in reverse. We're just finishing our cleanup. We're making sure that the area on the back of the engine case where the interconnect gasket seals up to is nice and clean. Oh man, the last thing that we want to have is this whole motorcycle back together and having a sealing issue of the oil passage between the engine and transmission because then, then we'd have to do it all over again. But that same ideology kind of applies to everything where if you do everything the absolute best the first time, then you don't have to do it a second time. So that's what we're doing. Cleaning up gasket surfaces, putting the interconnect gasket on the transmission, sliding that into place, light, lightly putting a screw in it just to hold it into position. Because we'll want to get our oil pan under there with an oil pan gasket. I cut myself. But it's alright. That's the type of time and energy that I put into these, these repairs. Get the oil pan in there. And the oil pan gasket. And again, because this situation is extended services paying for it. I got all new screws. The new screws are, it, it could be thought as overkill, but they're 50 cents each, so they aren't very expensive. They are already have the Loctite patch on them. So rather than taking the original screw, cleaning the screw, then putting Loctite on it, and putting it in, it's, it saves time overall. Because when you're a dealership technician, you really have to start weighing things out as far as does it make more sense to just buy the thing new or to put more time into something. Because time is money. Labor rate is not cheap. So if I'm wasting 20 or 30 minutes, you know, overall cleaning hardware, say 
Sam doing a whole engine and transmission. You could spend 20 or 30 minutes just cleaning hardware just by just by that. That's 50 bucks uh, in labor rate. So does it make more sense to spend that $50 on just new hardware? Because new hardware looks new. And everybody likes new looking stuff. So ultimately, it makes the most sense in this particular situation to get new hardware. It's going to look the best, work the best, be the best. But you get the oil pan in there, get all your screws started. Obviously, you want to make sure that your oil pan gasket is lined up correctly. Get all your screws in there, get them started, go back around, torque them down to factory spec. So here we are, we're buttoning up the bottom of the transmission. We've got the oil pan all torqued down. Everything is looking good. We're going to put the drain plugs back in the oil pan. This particular touring model oil pan has the drain plugs for both the transmission and the engine oil. Fixing drain plugs while well, getting them ready to put back into oil pans seems to be very difficult for the average consumer. It's real easy. You get your old uh, drain plug out, then you run, you get the O ring off of it, then you run it through a wire wheel and clean the threads off. That will clean any of the old pipe sealant off the drain plug. Then you put a new O ring on it. And then you put new pipe sealant, but only on the first like two or three threads and push it deep into the threads. I see a lot of times where people have problems with ripping of O-rings and that's because there's some sort of schmoo that gets stuck under the O-ring and pushes it out. And then as you're tightening the drain plug, the O-ring pushes out of where it's supposed to be. And then it gets cut. So it's really easy. Let all your oil drain. Make sure there's zero drips left. Clean up the little recess on the oil pan where the o ring's supposed to reside. And then clean up like your drain plug as previously stated. Roll it in there. Torque it down. Easy peasy. So we get to the transmission. And... Of course, the last guy had messed it up. Somehow, he damaged the threads on the drain plug. Not in the aluminum transmission case. I don't know if he had the drain plug like and, and tighten it down in a vise or something, but the threads were all wonked out on it. So we just go up to the parts department and get a new one. I think it was only a couple bucks. It doesn't matter. The customer's not paying for it. ESP's paying for it. So we're getting prepared to put the pivot shaft back in. So we're getting the alignment of everything the way that it needs to be because the engine needs to be suspended and the swing arm needs to be suspended so that the pivot shaft can slide through the frame swing arm transmission and so forth and I'm staring into the camera because I still don't know how to use this GoPro and we're learning as we go we're getting our pivot shaft ready to go in clean off the old anti seize we're putting a very thin layer of new anti-seize on. And we're being delicate about the wiggling and jiggling. Because it is like a precision fit of the pivot shaft through the spherical bearings of the swing arm. Then through the back of the transmission case. And then through the other spherical bearing on the other side. And then into the rear engine mount. Or the cleave block mount on the right hand side. So even though I'm hitting it, I'm, I'm hitting it lightly. It's a dead blow hammer. And you'll want to get under the swing arm to lift it up slightly, move it around. It is a very tight fit. Wiggle, jiggle. Get everything lined up. Put it through. There's a little indentation on the cleave block mounts like the rear rubber mounts and the cleave block you want to make sure that it hasn't fallen out or any of the spacers on the swing arm make sure that your 
indentation marks line up. Get everything lined up so that your cleave block mount slides on with uh, zero binding or hassle. Even though even though these are just like a half inch a half inch socket screw for the cleave block, I want to say it's like 55 or 65 foot pounds off the top of my head. I never try to remember torque specs for anything other than like something crazy like a rear axle that is just like you're doing a million of them. But anytime I try to remember a torque spec, it really opens up the opportunity for me to remember it wrong. So offsite, I have the service manual. I'm looking at it. I'm not looking at it right now because I'm at home, but I want to say it's 65 foot pounds, which is more than you would think of, of a half inch head screw. But that's where it makes sense to torque everything to spec. So we've got the pivot nuts on the shaft. It's the pivot shaft nuts on the shaft. And you torque them down because there's nut on either side of it. And then there's like a little lock bolt that goes through the center. So likewise, you hold one side of it, torque the other side, then flip, and then torque the one side, and hold the other side. That way the pivot shaft is exactly the way it's supposed to be along with its lock bolts. And then we pop a little the little black cover plugs back into place. And we have a new o-ring for the vehicle speed sensor. You never want to put o-rings in dry. I guess never is a can't always be correct but when it when the o-ring is definitely used for a seal and you're dragging it past an aluminum surface it definitely should be lubed so we lubricated the o-ring on the vehicle speed sensor we installed it we made sure that we didn't push it in sideways or do anything to cut the o-ring we put the screw in we torqued it down we're getting the, the nut back on the little stud for the ground cable. These things are under the starter, so it's easy to do now. We look at the camera because we st still don't know how it works. Honestly, I thought the GoPro had turned on and off multiple times through this, so I'm surprised that I have all the footage. We put the starter back into place. I like doing it like this. Uh, you could wait till you actually get the primary on to put the starter in like this, but through normal primary repairs, you typically don't have the starter on and off. So I'm used to dealing with it sitting in its basic position. What I like to do, even though the transmission case comes with a seal in the main output drive gear, I always pop that seal out, put the gear set in, and then put a new seal in. That way I'm 100% assured that the seal wasn't torn by the main shaft sliding through it. But we're just buttoning everything up, making sure everything's clean and dry here. And basically the way that it's going to be, um, the final amount of cleanliness. Because I don't like using the this motorcycle hoist for all of the work, but anytime that I'm working basically in the center of the vehicle, I put it on a normal bike hoist. I have a pole hoist that we're going to see soon that I like to transfer over to. It's easier to work on. I think it kind of goes a little bit taller maybe. I'm not sure about that. But this area of my bay is poorly lit, and it's it's over in the corner. So there's a lot more walking around the motorcycle with tools where moving the pole hoist which is in the middle of my bay it just makes it more pleasant to work on so we're getting there we're also hooking up the battery because we had it disconnected because we had the starter off uh, it makes sense to disconnect the battery before to be the first thing to disconnect and then the last thing to reconnect but 
we've done this before, so we know what we're doing. Ultimately, we're going to have to pull that seat back off, but that's for later in the show. We're just getting it, we're getting it on the pole hoist. We're excited for it. Here, we're going to get the correct screw for the passenger foot peg. Previously, somebody had found an extremely janky piece of hardware. When I have new hardware, um, in the winter, I go through and organize it and then put it in these little bins. That's where it was easy for me to just walk off site, grab, it, grab the bin, find the screw, pop it in. Little details like this go a long way. And it really saves time. There's a million reasons why I end up with new hardware. And when you got it and you can use it, you do it. Here we're just cleaning up a little residual oil on the belt guard. And then now we're putting in the seal for the shifter shaft. Now the way that I do this is I get just enough green tape to make just enough of one full rotation and then twist the end like a Tootsie Roll. What we're doing is we're covering the splines of the shaft and also the groove where there's going to be a snap ring because we don't want to push the seal on top of those sharp edges because it's going to gouge the seal and it's going to leak oil. So the inside of the seal when you buy it from Harley Davidson is already coated with heavy grease and we put a little bit of oil on top of the green tape just so it slides over. We cleaned up any residual grease with a q-tip and I always go and super inspect the seal surface after it's already put together with a flashlight and like super zoom in with my eye because if you see any damage to the dust seal of the oil seal then you know you're in for a problem and you should redo it but everything looked good so then we put the large washer it's like a it keeps all the grit and crap out of it it's like a metal seal I guess so we put that on there and then you want to make sure you get the snap ring in the groove you can get the snap ring not in the groove and then your sh shifter shaft will have too much play in it and then we put the shift rod on it has a quarter inch fine screw in it you make sure you get locked tight on it and you torque it down as hard as you can because people romp on that thing and make it loose. Now we've switched over to the pole hoist. We've got a brand new gear set. It comes right out of the box like that. So you just put the gasket on it. And since this is a new engine case, the dowel pins of the side door fit very tight into the new transmission case because it hasn't had dowel pins in it before. Like the little holes haven't been opened up by dowel pins yet. So the holes are tight. So that's where I'm lightly going around it with the dead blow handle. So that when we go and torque the screws down, we aren't putting a whole lot of pressure from the screw and asking it to plow a big gouge into the dowel pin hole. So we tapped it in. Now we're just running the screws in. And again, we have new screws here because whoever was here was using like I can't even imagine what type of tool they were using. It must have been the cheapest Allen bit in the world. They probably used a metric one or something and just hammered all the thread or hammered all the heads out of it. It was ridiculous. So we got new bolts, torqued everything down. You always use red Loctite for the two screws where your exhaust mount bracket bolts into the transmission. Again, we don't know that the camera's working, so we keep giving it giving it the angry eye or a weird grin. And then the secondary clutch actuator cover still has some metal in it from the original transmission disaster. So now we're just pulling the actuator out of it so we can take it over and clean the rest of the grit out of it. And that basically seals up the transmission. I should mention that before I slid in the gear shift selector, 
that I had oiled the shaft where it fits into the bushing of the transmission case. Also, I squirted oil into the counter shaft bearing that was already installed in the transmission case. So, and spun it around a couple times to make sure that that bearing was fully oiled. Along with the two needle bearings that are inside the main output drive gear that was already installed in the transmission case. That way, we don't have to worry about how long it's going to take for oil to get there the first few times that this transmission is spinning. Oil or bearings should always have oil in them. Like, not just assembly oil. You can see, like, earlier in the video, I had a little yellow squirt can. You just put a couple squirts in bearings, spin them around a few, t few times, then that way. You don't have to worry about things rolling around dry. We got our clutch release rod installed in the main shaft. We got the secondary actuator cover cleaned out, Loctite on the bolts, running them in, torqued them down. Then we put the actuator, the actual actuator, the actual actuator bolts in, torque them down, and now we're doing the same with the chrome cover, lock tight the bolts, run them in, torque them down. So now that we have everything installed and sealed up on the transmission that is below the oil level, you could just put the transmission fluid in through the dipstick, but since we have the top cover off, like we haven't installed it yet, and the gear assembly it's essentially dry because it's new. You know, we had just pulled it out of a box and tossed her in there. I like to put the transmission fluid in through the top cover. That way you can pour it on the gears. And then it gives you that good tingly feeling inside. And then we're going to get the new gasket. Obviously it's a new gasket. We're using all brand new gaskets through this whole, whole assembly. And we're finding them. And cleaning out the trans top cover because that that could have metal from the original disaster in there. So I had to clean that out, put it on. And then you can only torque down probably four of these bolts because two of them are under the rear cylinder. And I want to say I use I have a modified Allen wrench. That's probably the easiest way to do it if you're doing it at home is just to modify a 3 16 allen wrench cut it down but I have a couple different bits that I can fit in there and use a open-ended wrench with and a modified allen wrench whatever you gotta do you run the bolts in loose then come back around torque them down when possible I like using Old Faithful it's this little quarter inch Milwaukee ratchet it's, it's great for work like this because it runs things in, but it does it kind of slow, and it doesn't have a whole lot of power to it. So we're buttoned up on this side for now. We're just going to spin the whole motorcycle around. That way you guys can see what I'm doing, rather than me move all my stuff around again. So, before we had slid the transmission through... We pulled out the oil seal for the main shaft. Now we're grabbing the tool to put it in. It's from Jim's. It has a little cover on it that slides over the main shaft to protect your seal from um, the splines on the main shaft. So you clean all of that up, oil your seal, slide your seal on, pull the little safety cover off, Make sure your seal driver is nice and clean. Drive it in to the appropriate depth. It's already set by the seal driver. Clean everything up and inspect it. Make sure you're happy with it because it's easier to replace it now. And it's definitely not easy to replace it later. And then you put your primary bearing race on the main shaft. There's a little, um, little driver assembly for this, 
or installer I mean. And on this newer six speed transmission it already has a step in it so that you can't drive the inner primary bearing race in too far. But I have a little tool because on previous like early six speed versions and on five speeds you could just run that race in as far as you wanted to or not far enough. So there used to be this little horseshoe shaped tool to remove it but throughout the years at the dealership people had broken the bolts and lost the rest of the tools but this little horseshoe shaped piece still exists so I keep it and that way it's just confirmation that the primary bearing race is exactly where it's supposed to be on the main shaft so then you clean up the engine case get your new gasket pop it in there and here we're putting on the shifter linkage it's just easier to do it now than when the primary is on and you have to reach in behind it so we're getting that buttoned up and I lost footage of replacing the inner primary bearing itself which is too bad because the previous person had done it too so there's the back side of the inner primary and there's a bearing installed with it then a snap ring and then the oil seal so naturally in this type of work you replace the oil seal and behind it there's a snap ring and you got to put the snap ring in just right it's not really that hard just so that the opening is right towards the top so that it doesn't cover an oil passage for oil to drain from the oil from the inner primary onto the bearing and of course the last person in here put the snap ring in just the wrong spot so the, the freaking bearing couldn't even get oil to it this bike's such a mess but you make sure that's all right you put the seal on the back side of the primary and I like to put the primary on and tap it tap it in make sure that it's sealed on both the transmission and the engine case lightly and then install the bolts so you aren't trying to force things in where they aren't supposed to be going and then there's these little dowel pins that stick in the back of it to align the starter that I drop constantly and they're hollow they're the lightest lightest gauge steel dowel pins you'll ever see in your life but you don't want to make sure that you want to make sure that if you drop it you find it so that it doesn't get stuck in the drive belt or something so you get those finally fiddle around with it get the starter slid into the back of the primary so that you don't cut the o-ring on it or anything and torque that down as well and we're at this point we're really making good headway on this thing and things are going well and then we're starting to get the compensator and the clutch hub assembly put on I always leave the chain and everything on it so you don't have to you don't have to think twice about whether you have the chain going in the same direction that it was going previously because you want to keep things that have been worn together in the same orientation but you make sure the nut is nice and clean and that you've cleaned off all of the old Loctite put new Loctite on it and then I'm just running the bolts in a little bit with the impact here and then using the appropriate tool to hold the assemblies from rotating and then torquing, torquing them to spec. And before you just start cranking all these things down, even before we actually put the compensator and stuff on, you want to make sure that threads in the crankshaft are nice and clean and that there's nothing in there. There's one used bike that came through the dealership with compensator problems. And you're not like it's not normal to just look into the end of the crankshaft and really kind of visually inspect that there isn't foreign matter in there. But I had seen where somebody had wedged paper towel in the end of the crankshaft so that the, the bolt for the compensator couldn't have been tightened down correctly, which is crazy. So you always have to remember to double, double, double check everything because you, you never know how people are going to mess things up. It's crazy. But we get the tensioner in there, cut the zip tie off of it so that it's unloaded. 
click it up a little bit and then put the bearing in for the clutch release everything looks good clean the surfaces up in the primary put the gasket on we got the primary cover on and now we're just running the bolts in obviously they have Loctite on them but we're just running them in lightly with the impact even though that's a huge impact and it has like they call it breakaway torque 1100 pounds that thing's a beast it's more powerful than any snap-on well it's more power than the snap-on impact that I have like an air impact but it's also super controllable so these bolts tighten down to 140 inch pounds and the trigger on that huge impact is so nice you can just like just feather it in there now we're going around a couple times making sure everything's torqued perfectly and we're getting the footboard on this one has little spacers on it so like the exhaust system on this bike has you space out the right footboard in this particular model um, or this particular vehicle they had purchased the additional spacers so that so that the right and left footboards match which is nice and here we're going to be wasting our time by putting the actual gear shifter through the primary because we get it in there we get everything torqued down so that it's perfect and everything only to find out that again somebody had done something stupid before us there's a little rubber spacer that's on the end of the the shifter shaft that goes through the primary and somebody must use like some sort of penetrating oil on it so it swol it had gotten taller but shorter and it's a piece of rubber usually like rubber expands and swells like in all directions somehow this one got taller and hard and it left it so when we put the shifter assembly into the primary the little rubber spacer didn't take up all the slack so it it was able to rattle back and forth which is another pet peeve of mine so we pulled it off and cut it off and got angry at it and then we went and just got a new spacer again it's just like another two dollars it's not even cost the customer two dollars but the person before that owned the bike before it's like four dollars of stupid little crap people that had messed up before us that's the difference between a bike being radly and stupid and being nice and a polished product it's like four dollars so it's ridiculous but we make sure that we didn't that we put primary oil in it while we're waiting on this little rubber spacer again you know filling it up proper oil level up to the bottom of the diaphragm spring torquing the cover bolts down in situations like this I always WD-40 the jiffy stand a little bit there we go we're cutting the old crappy one off we got the new one from the parts department and we're seeing how that shifter assembly should be orientated like the end of the levers sh shouldn't really be further out than the shaft there is a little bit of wiggle room but if you do this right that rubber little spacer that we slid on there is supposed to have a slight amount of tension on it to keep the shifter lever assembly from rattling and the rattling is so freaking annoying I don't understand how people can ride these motorcycles around and not only hear that rattling so I guess you could call it a pet peeve of mine but now we have it all fixed up so it's nice and beautiful since we have it on the hoist it's easy enough to make sure that the tires are filled up now because realistically when the customer gets his bike back even though it's been here for a week or whatever if he's riding it around and it rides kind of funny or he checks the tire pressure and it's low he's gonna go he's gonna be thinking in his mind man that place sucks even though I did amazing work up to this point so we're always checking tire pressure now we're 
arguing with this exhaust system again. I was in a bad place in my mind because I knew this exhaust system was going to piss me off even before I tried to put it back up on the motorcycle. So I should have taken a couple breaths before I grabbed it because I got it up here and then I was upset it, just because the thing was pissing me off. It's so stupid that things have to be manufactured like like this. So here shortly I lose a very expensive socket, but I find it. I find it like four days later, so everything's okay. But just another lesson I'm learning, reteaching myself that you got to slow down and pay attention. And the stupid exhaust system doesn't have any feeling, so it doesn't matter if you're pissed at it. It doesn't give a shit. Oh, this stupid exhaust system. These stupid saddle bags. But we're we're getting everything lined up. Got to get the ex the exhaust pipes into the the ports of the cylinder head. You got to make sure that you're using the right exhaust gaskets because obviously that's going to matter a lot. We're getting everything lined up. Getting the carriage bolt in, that's a real pain in the butt. And we can tell at this point that the exhaust system has to move it in closer to the motorcycle. Or else the saddlebags are never going to fit right. Because they're aftermarket bags. So I try to bop it a few times with my hand. And I'm talking to it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to ask it, ask it nicely and things aren't happening. So we're going to start using some extreme measures here which... I absolutely don't recommend but but they have to be used sadly enough so in the 10 years I've been doing this I haven't ever had to ratchet strap an exhaust system so ghetto so ghettoly to pull it into the motorcycle so it can fit correctly with aftermarket poop bags but that was really the only option we had the correct parts well we had the correct parts for this situation like the correct gaskets the correct exhaust bracket just if you see the earlier video how much the muffler had worn into the saddlebag we had to do something and the customer asked us to so that really sucks because that means I really have to actually do something so everything is where it's ultimately going to be all the nuts and bolts are on loosely and then I use a microfiber cloth over the exhaust system and I, rat I use a ratchet strap around the transmission to pull the exhaust system in closer to the motorcycle and then we tighten all of the hardware down of course to specification and we can tell that the slip-on muffler needs to be rotated which is such a pain in the butt because the heat the rear heat shield on this goes before and after the exhaust clamp so you have to take the heat shield off to loosen the clamp up to rotate the rear of the muffler just slightly and then the way that they put the stupid exhaust clamps on are from the top which is ridiculous in this type of situation because exhaust clamps the heads should always they should really always be facing down or so that you don't see them if there is a possibility and in this situation they should be facing down but they're not so then you have to argue with it even more and I'm using players because when they originally put this pipe together you know this muffler has been married to this head pipe for a long time even though I've loosened the clamp we have WD-40 and we've tapped around it we're asking it for help we still have to force it but ultimately we get what we need out of it which is awesome because we could have just spent all of that time and energy and frustration for nothing and it could have still just been a big pile of crap but we manhandled it and worked it into submission and everything still looks good here we're still trying to loosen up the clamp because we've got the head pipe where we need it to be 
but the muffler, the muffler could be rotated slightly. And this is really, really where having good quality work done on your vehicle right from the get-go really sets in motion how and like as to how well the vehicle is going to be forever all of this frustration with this stupid muffler is because of how the exhaust system was originally assembled on this vehicle like the muffler is only fighting with us because it was never installed well right from the freaking get-go if it was assembled correctly from the get-go then everything would have been lined up correctly and the stupid saddlebag wouldn't have been rubbing on the exhaust system and then for the transmission repair we would have just popped the exhaust system off then just popped the exhaust system on and then everything could have been cool but it can't be cool because everybody has to half-ass their jobs in life. And whoever was paid to do all of this work right from the get-go, half-ass the whole, the whole thing. They did a half-ass job on the exhaust system. And then the next person that had to do the transmission did a half-ass job on the exhaust system. Or, psh, on the transmission. And you add two halves and you get a whole-ass piece of vehicle. So don't do a shitty job, is what I'm saying. When things don't look right, and they don't feel right, that means you aren't doing it right. So, if you're doing crappy jobs installing exhaust systems, don't be wasting my time in the future. I don't have patience for it. Alright, so now that we're done with that, and we, we've cooled down, we're getting the rest of the bike together, getting the footboard on. We're so happy to be done with that exhaust system. Get the board on, run the bolts in, torque it down. Then we clean up the exhaust system. And not that it's a surprise or anything, but even though after all that fighting and arguing with that exhaust system it has no additional marks or signs of aggravation or anything on it it just it fits on there and it looks right and that's where it needs to be but we forgot that we put the seat on too early because the customer had along with other complaints well other problems that the customer was having with the motorcycle was that the turn signals were wigging out and he had mentioned that there were just like wires openly dangling and shorting out so it looked like with the original saddlebag somebody had installed a plasma rod type of additional light on it and got rid of those saddlebags and put these aftermarket saddlebags on but just cut the wiring and just let it dangle on the wheel and the belt and short out so he asked me to look into it and it was as simple as removing the connector that was plugged in between the rear fender lighting so we're just killing it now transmissions boss exhaust systems boss wirings boss there you can see how, how much the exhaust system was all up in the saddlebag and I'm trying to put the saddlebag on and the saddlebag fits all, all funky and on this year motorcycle like the saddlebag brackets aren't adjustable so if it fits funky then something funky is happening so after sitting here and starting to get upset with it I take I take a moment and I go you know what if it doesn't fit right something's not right and it's because somebody had wrapped toilet paper and electrical tape around the saddlebag guard to try to keep the saddlebag off the exhaust system. All of this, all of these extra steps and extra situations are because the original person put the exhaust system on poorly. So now we have to undo all of those steps. 
So now the friggin' saddlebag fits on the way that it's supposed to. Even though it has these really chintzy little knobs that make it difficult to spin in. Even with those chintzy knobs, the saddlebag fits right. And it looks right. And it feels right. So we're sitting there. We're playing with the chintzy knobs. Taping up the license plate because I have a real challenge uh, trying to blur, the, blur them out. I don't think it really matters, but whatever. Getting the other saddle bag on. I'm so excited to be almost done with this motorcycle. Like, It's always nice to see a project almost done. But let's take a look at that exhaust system gap. Look how beautiful that is. Look at all the light in between there. Like that really makes us feel good because all that time and energy that we put into it, even though we were being a little childish and got upset with it, are really paying off. Like, it's going to be good. So the last thing that we have to do is to replace the right switch pack assembly. Because it had been wigging out in such a way where it would cause vehicle communication problems. And cause the speedometer to just show unusual odometer readings. Like I want to say the customer said it would just go to 10,000 miles or something. And then it would come back and go to like the 6,000 miles that's on the vehicle. And I had originally plugged into the bike and it had codes for switch pack communication problems. So we just went... The repair for that is really just replacing the switch pack. So that's why we went and replaced the switch pack. There is no further diagnosis with that. Now we're just checking it all out. Making sure that the turn signals work, brake lights work, all of the buttons on that right switch pack that we replaced. Also the left switch pack. Just double checking things before we leave the bay, make it upstairs and do the test ride. Thanks for watching. Subscribe. Click like. Thanks.